I'm going to do this. How's everybody doing this week? Good, thank you. Good, Good thanks. Thanks. This is kind of like any test this week for you guys, or everybody was kind of. I have mental health tomorrow. Oh dear. Do we have peds after this again? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, we have we'll get, <laughs> we'll get out of here early. Don't worry. I'll let you guys out a little early. Um, if I go too long, just remind me. Okay. Um, I want to congratulate everybody. I was super, super proud of this class with your exam scores this week. They were wonderful. Um, clear. Sorry, I'm just eating a grape. I just ran in the house. So, um, you know, really clear that you guys studied, put your time in, put your effort in. I was really, really impressed with your grade. So excellent job. You guys are getting it down. You know how to study now. Uh, any pointers? I had several 98s and 96s. So um, I won't call anyone out, but anybody have a suggestion on what they did that they found really helpful this time? Come on, I had 96s and 98s. What'd you guys do? Listen to all the, re <laughs> all the reviews. The Listen review to reviews. all the reviews from all the different professors. It makes a difference. Yes. Good. Did you see some overlap? Yes. Good. So what I hope you found with the overlap is what we all talk about, we test on, right? So that's a really good way to do. What I will tell you is, is that we will have another review before our last test. I did our mid mods this week. So if you did not get an email from me, then um, don't yeah. worry, you're in good shape. It's going into our you know second half of the quarter. So congratulations to all of you guys. I didn't have many this time. So good, really hard work. It's paying off. Um, I wanna go over just a few things with you guys. Uh, somebody asked me to go over the um, infectious disease project. So I'll go over that quickly. And um, what I want to remind everybody is our APA formatting. So now we're halfway through the quarter. So my flexibility on it is going to be less. Okay. So what that means is I need you citing when you write. Just remember, you cite when you write. So I'll pull up an example for you. I don't have one right this second, but I will pull one up for you guys. I want you to remember to do that because that'll get you a big chunk of all of our um all of our writing assignments. So infectious disease is due this week, week seven. No, sorry, next week, week seven. Um, I get confused with the weeks. What are we? Where we are week seven. Week seven. We're yeah. week seven. So sorry. Okay, so we are due this uh, Wednesday. Every person is posting the paper. What I will tell you is, is I grade you on the paper all the same. You know, so the paper is graded as a paper, and then each individual person um, will take a look, take a look at those peer reviews that are on there. I know there was some difficulty with peer reviews. What I want you guys to do is fill them out. You're filling it out on all of your group members, and then you will send it to me in an email. Okay, so you can't submit it; you have to save it and send it. Okay, so we'll do that. Um, infectious disease. There's a criteria, and there is a. Um, uh, rubric as usual. So let's just go over the rubric real quickly so that everybody has what they need to do by tomorrow. Everybody should be about done at this point, but um, just in case you just have some questions and I think one of your classmates had questions. So let me pull it up for us and we'll take a look at everything. And rubrics are really easy. Like I said, you're gonna know, um, you're gonna know what your score is. You could probably score yourself. Because if you look at the rubric and you do everything that's on there, then you will get the full credit. So what you're doing is you guys all picked a disease process, which I'm glad because we're going to talk about infectious disease tonight. And um, you're going to share some of your wonderful knowledge. So if we take a look at our criteria, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, thanks. So we're making sure that we have all this included and remember APA format in text citations. I'm gonna click on that for you guys because I'm seeing a lot of us are not doing it in, in the site, in, in, in text citations. So for basically, let me just do a quick one. So if you're paraphrasing, and I ask most of you guys to paraphrase because that tells me that you understand what you're, um, what you're reading, okay? When you 
give it to me back in quotes that tells me sometimes that you're not understanding the content, you're just copying and pasting. Anybody who knows me who's had a written assignment up till this point, you know that I do check your references. So please don't think I won't um, double check. And I only do that because as I'm reading, it's very obvious to me when people are writing with their own words and when they're cutting and pasting off the internet. So no cutting and pasting on the internet for this one. But so here's an example. Um, so they're re they're paraphrasing something that they read. So here, Webster Stratton in 2016 described a case of a four-year-old who showed insecure attachment to her mother and working with a therapist on increasing empathy for the child. So see here, within the writing, we're giving the year and the source, okay? So that's your best way to paraphrase. Now, once you've paraphrased, you're then gonna at the bottom, you know, do your reference page and you'll do that again. Here's another way that we see um, paraphrasing. Now, this is a huge paragraph, so I would tend to see this probably with your infectious disease. So the author is at the beginning, and it's Velez et al., because it's more than three authors, right? And then we put a year, so that when I'm reading the paper, I know exactly where you're getting this content from. Are there any questions on that? Because I'm seeing a lot of not citing in the text. You're citing at the bottom. Professor? I have, uh -huh. I'm sorry, I have a question. I always uh, do the in-text citation, uh -huh. but next to the year, I always put the, the pages. So it can be like that or it has to be at the end? No. So the only time I look for page numbers is when you're quoting something. So you're putting it in quotation marks and then you're going to give me a page. If you're not quoting anything for our writing, we're not worrying about it. Okay. So if you're paraphrasing, you do not need a page number. Um, if you're direct quoting, let's see if we have a direct quote here. I think we do. Uh, no. Oh, uh, no, we don't have one here. But if you're direct direct quoting, like this has quotation marks around it, then you would have your, your year and your page number and your author. Is that clear? So I want to show you another one here, which is really helpful. What ends up happening here is sometimes as you're reading, you're going to combine different authors. So best bet is to just cite the authors as you write them. So like here, uh, play therapists, uh, you know, including emotional exhaustion or reduced ability to empathize, empathize with others. We put in our authors and then we do it again. And then we um, have in our first quotation, we have two separate authors and two separate things, which is good. The more data you have, the more information you have from different sources, the better the source, the better the information is, right? Because we know we want to see that repeated, that evidence-based practice, we want to see it repeated. So see how here they cite one author and the year and another author and the year. And then here we're citing one author and another author and the year. So that's how you combine them if you're using two separate sources. Any questions on that? Because what I'll tell you from here on, and this applies for your vulnerable population one that you guys are doing with me, that's a big chunk out of the um, the rubric. And so I'm going to make sure that we are on top of it and we know what we're doing. Any questions about APA? Remember, Purdue Al is your best bet. You probably have one person in your group who's really good with Purdue Al, so have them do it, okay? because that's what I always suggest. All right, so now when we look back at our group project discussion, here's what I want out of your rubric. It's here at the bottom. Oops. Hey, now. Where is your rubric on this one? I have so many. Okay, so on your rubric, what you're gonna make sure you have in all of them is your name of infectious disease, scientific name, cause, symptoms, mode of transmission, complications, treatment, prevention, how it is tracked and surveyed, that's a big section that sometimes gets lost, and who is most vulnerable, okay? So we wanna remember all of that. We'll have our title, title page, but you know, I'm not that picky about title pages and numbers. I just want you guys getting into the habit of writing and citing. That's how I like to do it. One other requirement that you guys do have is at least two different sources, okay? Any questions on that? On our module under week seven, here is the um, the peer review document. If you pull it up, it's a Word document and you will give numbers to every member of your group. If you think your group worked fabulous together and you wanna give everybody fives, you can say on there five for the whole group. You don't have to do one for each person. But if there were, you had a five and a four and a two, then 
do for each person. Juan, you have a question? No, you're good. I was just giving air fives to my group. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, good. So I'm glad to see that. And I, um, I'm hoping we get a lot of fives, but you know, everybody works a little differently, but the good thing about this, it's training you guys to work as a team. And I will tell you as being a nurse for a hundred years that I am, yeah, you have to work as a team. There's no two ways around it. Even if you don't like the people, you still figure it out. All right. So I'm going to take a tennis real quickly. Natalie, you're with us, right? Yes, professor. Okay. Juan's here. Uh, Nirmala, I saw you. You're here. Yes, yeah, are you here? No, he's not here. Anybody know where he is? No. All right, Lorelai, you're here. Ty, you here? There you are. And Indira. I'm here. Thank you. Sorry about the multiple emails. I didn't have the thing attached when you sent it to me. I don't know why. Uh, so you are working now, it open? Yep, I'm good. Okay. I graded you. Heidi. Here. Thank you. Uh, Yossi. Here. There you are. Amoy. I saw you somewhere come in. You here? I'm here. There you are. Helen. I'm here. Raina. Katrina. Oh, there's Yasser. I'm here. Katrina. Great. Jesse. Sorry, Professor. No worries. Yeah. Sylvia. Here. here. Okay. Nicole. Here. Uh, Yanessi. Here. Jacqueline. I'm here. Jocelyn. I'm Jocelyn. Here. Oh, you're here. Thank you. Lindsay. I'm here. And Genevieve. Okay. So I'm here. You're here? Where are you? Uh, yeah, you're here, but Genevieve's not here, correct? And you're here. Okay, good. All right, so we have almost everybody. Yes, so you're here. Okay, so um, any questions on what's due this week? Sorry, I'm getting confused between six and seven, but you guys have that infectious disease, which will come our way, um, and you guys should be working on that. So what I will tell you is, is that we have, um, what we have is, Sorry, my daughter's trying out for the super team right now. So I'm probably, she's nervous. Um, so anyway, we're gonna work on community evaluation tonight and we're gonna take a look at communities and what do we look at with them, right? So what are some things that you guys, if you've started working on your vulnerable populations, what are some things you look at when you're looking at a community? The elderly, children. Okay. So you're looking at your groups of people. What else are you looking at? The education level. Tell me more about that. Uh, for example, here in, I think, Miami, maybe Homestead, where live many migrants. There's All right, so you know where the school. Yep, yeah, so remember, you're going to know where it starts and where it ends, the community, right? Because it starts at some spot and ends at another spot and then another town pops up, right? Good. So you're on the right path. What else are we looking at with our communities? Available yeah. hospitals. Yeah, resources. Mm -hmm. Transportation. Say that again. Transportation. Yeah, transportation. Yep. How are they getting around? What else do we worry about when we're looking at a community? Somebody hit on it a little bit, resources with a hospital. What can you tell me more about that? Healthy problems. What did you say? Healthy problems. Yeah, health problems, right. What are they facing? Um, yeah, diabetes, you know, hypertension. Mm -hmm. Yep. Chronic, chronic. And yep, chronic disease for sure. So we're going to take a look at all that stuff. And then 
what uh, we're going to overlap into teaching tonight as well, because a part of community, um, what level of prevention is our teaching that we do? Primary. Primary. Yep. Primary. So our primary is going to be our teaching. So we're going to look at how when we after we assess the community, how are we going to teach them? So I want you guys to take a look at something that is a really good way to see how we will look for conducting a community assessment. And it's just interesting because this community assessment is related to financial situation, but why is it not working? Hold on a sec. My computer's really slow today. It doesn't wanna work, All right? So when we look at our community assessments, these are the kind of things that we're gonna look at. And the reason I like this is because it breaks it down for us really clearly what we're looking at. So I'll try to enlarge it for you guys if it's too small. Is it too small? Should I make it bigger? It's fine. Good. All right, so the first thing we're gonna look at is we're gonna define our scope. So when we look at things, we look at, uh, for example, something that is related to everybody. So we see sometimes we'll see like high school dropouts and we're gonna see how that's related to homelessness, right? Remember one of our largest populations of homeless is what? What's our largest growing population? Families with children. Children of family. Yep. So what is our high school dropout rate? What do we know about education and uh, economics? Having a lower education causes you to, you know, not be able to get as a good paying job as having a higher education would. Good. So when we're looking at this, we also see homeless is related to the head of household unemployment. So what do we know about unemployment and education? Same kind the of thing low, Sylvia said. The lower the education, the higher the poverty level. Right. And know that our, our uh, we're going to see those lower um lower opportunities for jobs right regardless where that is and then we look like unemployment and how does that involve gang involvement and how then do we go back to our gang involvement and then going to high school dropout rates so does everybody see how this is all kind of overlapping so we're not necessarily looking at a community and just looking at the adults or the kids we're seeing where is the overlap there so that's an important message to look at so we define our scope in the community and then there's some questions that they go over oops and then we decide what are we going to focus on? So are we gonna go solo or are we gonna go all together? So examine what's available and what can we find out? So with our vulnerable population group, we're picking one out of that, right? Because we don't wanna have a huge scope of a whole city. Sometimes it gets too engaging too much, okay? So then we continue on and then we collect our data. Now, this is how you guys are doing your data collection for your community assessments, right? You're thinking about what resources do I have? You say, can I find some secondary information? Can I just see with my own eyes in my windshield survey what I'm finding? And so we look at our different things that we can look, ooh, different sources of where we can find stuff. So we look at that. And then we determine what is true. What have we found? So are there trends in our data? Is there differences across different parts of our community? And how do we get our answers and our questions in our survey? Then we're gonna, as nurses, this is where we come in. We're gonna set our priorities and we're gonna do our action plan. So we've assessed, what's our next level? With our ad pie. Diagnose. Diagnose. So this is where we're kind of diagnosing and implementing at the same time, okay? So we're gonna look at um, what is our priority? Is it a human problem? Is it a process problem? Meaning is it something going on that's causing the problem? Is it structural? Is there no communication like in a rural community? And that's where we see it. Is it institutional? Is there something that we're seeing that is not, um, is not working, the schools, the hospitals, the resources? And then what we do finally is our last step in any community assessment is we're going to share our findings, right? So in you, for you guys, you're going to be um, sharing your findings in a PowerPoint. But what we want to make sure when we're sharing our findings is that we focus on um, our key findings that may relate to one overall scenario. We can use charts and graphs. What do we know about learning and readers?
What do you know about learners and greeters, uh, readers? Why would we use graphs and why would we use charts? Why wouldn't we just use all words? Because some people are very visual learners and so they need to be able to see the data in order to understand it. Yeah, so some people are gonna like to look at a graph way better than read up several paragraphs, right? And when you're reading in your book, have you noticed that in your book, you have graphs, you have tables, you have all this other stuff, right? I tend to teach you guys with videos as well because I feel like that's stimulating to the visual learners and to the audio learners also, right? So think about that when you're doing your community assessment. What else are you gonna make sure that you're doing is that making sure that our community members are not involved in the assessment as a way to like get something. So you don't wanna go out to your homeless uh, community and say, here, I'm gonna give you some, uh, what, uh, granola bars, uh, what, uh, they usually like um, quick foods or here's $5 for everybody, I'm gonna assess your community, right? Because what's that gonna cause in, that, in, our, in our collection? Bias. Very good. Very good. You're going to see bias pop up there. And so you want to remember that when you guys are being doing this as a nurse. Okay. So this is a lot of resources that this um, organization had. And I use it because it uh, corresponds to some of your reading. And what I wanted you guys to get out of that really is all the different steps that we look at with community assessments. Okay. Because it's not just going out there and saying, what do they have? What do they need? We also look at our resources. Are they productive? Are they useless? Are they right? All those different things. Any questions on community assessment uh, as a whole? No. All right. I didn't send out your PowerPoints for this week, but I'll send them out at uh, half time or whatever. Okay. We will then go into economic, uh, let's go into education and learning. What do we know about learners? Because once we've done our community assessment, we're going to have to be doing some teaching to the community and to all of our resources. What do we know about learning as a whole? They got to be willing to learn. Excellent. Excellent. They have to have a mind and they want to learn, right? Because if, they, if they're close to education, then that's a problem. What else do we know is important? We have to teach to their ability to understand. If we're using big words and and not kind of dumbing it down to where they can understand it. It's our teaching is going to be useless. Okay. And when you're teaching, what kind of things are you going to use for those type of people? We just sort of hit on this. Pamphlets. Mm -hmm. You're always going to want to do handouts. What else? What other kinds of things are you going to do to make sure people are understanding what you're teaching? You free, you first teach and then have them. Have uh, them show it back to you very good so you well, guys yeah. are going to be teaching back to us this evening because that's a really good technique of knowing that you've understood what you've learned right what other things are we looking at when we're when we're planning to do something with our community to <laughs> whether it's a group of people or just a few they <laughs> sorry go ahead Anybody? What are we? What other things are we thinking about? They language barrier. Mm, you know, say what you said again. The age. So oh the yeah, definitely. Teenagers, little people. What yeah, do you think the older generation, generation likes? Or elders? What kind of teaching are we going to do to them? Are we going to tell them to pull out their smartphone? And look on the web. No, they're more, like, they're more like paper and reading and showing them. You, yeah, you know, they're hands on. We're hands on. Yeah, and we have several no different generations that we look at, right? Let me think about our. So our baby boomers are going to be our older population. What about the new, uh, the newer generation that we have going on right now? Anything that's a tablet, electronic, or anything like that, they're going to be fine with it. Yeah, they're not going to technology. What technology. size? Say that again, yes, sir. What size? What size? How big the group is? Yeah, yeah definitely. But we want to think about as we go across the spectrum, right, of the different ages and what they will hit as we go along. So our baby boomers are not going to like the technology. Our young ones, what else do you know about them? Anybody who has kids, younger kids knows this. What do they need constantly? Playing. 
redirection, mm-hmm. very short attention spans. Good. Excellent. They have very short attention spans and we see that across a lot of young kids. So what do we need to do with them? We're not going to lecture to them for two hours because they're done about five minutes in, right? And they like color, they like variety, they like movies, they like cartoons, things like that. So we're teaching when we're thinking about that. With our middle school and high schoolers, what kind of things are we focusing on when we're teaching to them? Drugs. Say that again, Helen? Drugs, no, 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 don't do that, drugs. Okay. Don't do drugs. Yes, that's a good one yeah, to teach fear, them. Fear pressure, their friends, what friends are into. Because if okay. their friends don't think it's cool, they're not going to even entertain the idea. Absolutely. What kind of teaching are we going to do with them? Are we going to stand in front of them and lecture? Interactive teaching would be beneficial. What's something that anybody who has a teenager excluding me because my daughter doesn't like them, but what do a lot of teenagers like to do? Bullying. Uh, Electronics. Yeah, they do. Yeah. They yeah. do. Yeah. Electronics. What do they do all the time? They have this thing in their hand like this, right? Texting. All of them are on video, video games, right? Social media. Texting, video games, social media, right? talking to this one, talking to that one. So we want to really give them some apps that they could use, right? If we're teaching them something. Oh, if you want to go on your phone and add this app, that's the latest and greatest. Or, you know, we really want to be thorough with them on good information versus information they're reading on Facebook. Well, they don't, Facebook apparently is for old people, but um, Snapchat and all that stuff, right? And so what that's, about, Professor, huh? what about the sex? Because we have to teach about sex too. We have to go in teenager age, right? Yeah. Yeah, you want to teach yeah. that. What age of the teenager do you want to teach that? Well, I spoke with my daughter and my son's since 12, 11, mm-hmm. 12 years Good. old. Yeah. My middle school. Yeah. yeah. You want to do that earlier on because what we're finding and the stories I could share with you guys, but I won't, of what mm-hmm. happened in middle school is just you you almost can't believe what they're doing in middle school. And they have no idea what they're doing. So, you know, education that early is something that we as nurses can do. You know, we don't necessarily want to leave that to an educator unless that's in their curriculum. But if we are their nurse and we can say to them, this is what's safe, this is what's not safe. I'll give you guys an example. I had a student this two weeks ago came into my office and she said that she had partaken in activities over the weekend. And I said, well, did you use protection? And she said, oh yeah, plan B. And I thought, oh boy. So, so I was like, well, plan B is not really protection, but so I said, are you concerned about anything else? And she said, oh, no, 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 plan B works. I said, okay. So that gave me an opportunity, right, to teach her a ton of stuff. And I did, I took that opportunity as a nurse to teach her about, you know, what other types of protection. So just think about that, guys. We're really assessing these kids and what their knowledge is and what, obviously that's, commonplace in high school. Who knew? I certainly didn't, but, um, you know, things like that. So we'll take a look real quickly at um, teaching. And as usual, I have a lovely video for you guys. So I want you to think about there's three domains of learning. Has anybody heard about them or read about them? Uh, That's a hard no, huh? That was in our reading for this week, but that's okay. So there's three different types, right, guys? There's three different types of learning that go on. One is gonna be that knowledge where people are using their brains to get information in and get it out. There's two other methods. Think about what physical therapists use a lot to teach. Their emotions, emotional feelings. Good, that's one of them. Objects, do they use Say that again, Jesse. you said something. Kinetic learning. Yeah. So it's psychomotor. Very good. So we're going to have all three of those. So Nicole said the feeling one, that's one. So good. We have our knowledge one, and then we have our psychomotor where it's movement. And, you know, a lot of people do really well. That's why you guys have um, sims, right? Because you use your psychomotor there. And your lecture is more about um, knowledge. And then you're going to have all over the place feelings because that can come up anywhere. So let's take a a little video on this. Bloom's taxonomy should ring a bell to us. 
right? Sort of from another class, I hope. And so that's our different levels of learning. We start at, it's a pyramid. And so you start at the very basic and you get higher up and higher up, right? So that's gonna be something that we wanna focus on. So hold on one sec, I'll pull up our video. Oops, I'm not gonna share yet. Uh, any questions yet so far? We're covering a lot tonight, I will tell you that guys. So, but I'm trying to focus what I want you guys to know. I just wanna show you a little graph that I have for our different generations and what we see with them. So let me just pull that up really quick. So this is something that uh, when we're teaching, we really wanna remember because we talked a little bit about what kinds of content we would teach. But in addition, we wanna know how we're gonna hit our audience. Um, somebody had said that we need to know our audience and you sure do, because the way you teach to one is not the way you teach to another, right? So I'm just gonna show you a quick graph that I like and then we'll take a look at the video. It just lays it out for you because what we come to see is, is that uh, across the generations uh, are teaching and what they're looking for, although the content may be the same, our method of delivery is going to be very different. So if we take a look at this, let me just... Um, hold on, I got to share with you guys. Here's a graph that like lays it out for us, right? So we look at um, our different generations. And so we have our generation X, we have our baby boomers, and then we have our millennials. I didn't talk about them too much, but um, is anybody working with a group of millennials? Millennials are born, what's the age frame I forget? Born 77 to 97. Anybody work with young people? Some of us are in that Generation X, but. Um, so when you work the millennials, there's this feeling of, um, I don't need to put a lot of work in sometimes. And that's really not their fault. That's how they've been taught. Because we as adults have raised kids to get, um, you know, trophies for lots of things and um, all those kind of things. So when they're working in the work environment, and this is important to remember when you're in a community, they're used to getting quick responses and quick feedback. And that feedback is usually, they're used to positivity. So we wanna make sure that we're giving that positivity so that they're more resilient and listening. So when we take a look at our traditionalists, these are our, these are gonna be our, traditionalists, you know, they're like 22 to 1945 ish time period. And so their learning style, remember what do, these are like our grandparents. So what kind of teaching was going on during that, that period? If at all, because we're early on there guys. So what was happening in that early on time period? Wasn't it more like, um working learning not so much school learning well say. for some for sure school wasn't as as available as has as it has become right so that's good what else did they know about technology that this these are like grandparents guys so um what do they know about technology they don't know a whole lot <laughs> <laughs> they're very old school they don't like you know tvs they they grew up listening to the radio and listening to the programs and stuff on the radio and so the like that was their childhood and then slowly you know technology came about with a black and white tv but those weren't very affordable for most people right and if anybody has been in disney world it's just a great thing it's the kids don't like the ride, but it's a ride and you go through and you see the differences along the time period. Has anybody ever been on that one? So you spin around yes. and you see how they've changed. Epco. Epco. Yeah, Jessie's shaking her head. So I know she's seen it, isn't it? I think it's called the Carousel of Progress or something. Yes, like that. that's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. So what happens is you see this family and how they change over time. And that's really a good example. I wish I could show you guys a video because it's 
fun to see anyway. But anyway, so our, our you know, we're, we're talking about 1922 to 45, and then we move on to our baby boomers, which is now our elder population, really. And so what we know is, you know, um, kind of unsure about that technology, like they have the smartphone, but they're like, I'll give you an example. My dad's a baby boomer and he'll, I'll say to him, download, download an app and he'll say, oh, I can't do that. I don't have Wi-Fi. I don't know what Wi-Fi is, right? Does anybody have parents like that where they don't even, yeah. <laughs> so it's always fun though, because it gives us an opportunity as nurses to teach to our patients who might be afraid of that, but they're going to be much more, you know, um, much more verbal handouts, those kind of things. Then we go to our generation X, okay? And then we're going to have more e-learning. We're going to be doing our, um, you know, sharing a best practice, those kind of things. And then we go to our millennials again, like we've talked about. So we're going to have like those podcasts we can use when we're teaching. We could do webinars, technology. We want to be very very, very aware that they like technology. And so we're going to use that to the best. Like we said, download some apps, things like that. All right. So I just wanted to show you that little piece on our different generations. So any questions up till this point on what we've gone over? So we've pretty much covered our community assessment and then our we're starting with our learning. Um, has anybody done, has anyone done some teaching to patients? And what kind of teaching have you done that you found successful? Any? The only teaching I primarily do, unfortunately, it's it's to the hospice and just let them learn what the benefits are. It's not always so negative as it is to most of the population. They think it's a negative thing. When I should, in essence, it helps out a lot in the home. Good. So do you do a lot of verbal teaching or how do you teach? No verbal. It's my thing is primarily the presentation, what we're, you know, how we manage the symptoms and what we're there for and how the benefits go together. Awesome. Okay. I'm a pamphlet, but primarily it's me talking. Okay. And who else has done some teaching along the way? I do you quite a bit of um, post-op teaching, medication administration teaching with my patients. Um, the medication administration, I have them I show them and then I have them demonstrate it back. Um, I work in pediatrics, so I have to make sure that the parents know, you know, it's it's 0.5 mLs, not five mLs. So, you know, the, the my patients are very fragile cardiac babies. So that's very important to have them teach back. Very good. Excellent. So that's gonna be our best thing. The way to remember that is like Jesse just said, think of those babies and how we have to really have those um, those parents show us, right? How about, who's another group that we're gonna use teach back with frequently? I, I work with geriatrics and I have to do that like with um, inhalers and stuff like that, teach them how to use it. And sometimes do they feel overwhelmed by that? We have to remember that when we're teaching, right? They can yeah. Say, right? Okay, good. You're going to see a lot of teaching with any chronic illness, right? Think about our diabetics, how much teaching goes on with that, right? So you're not just teaching them about their body, but you're teaching them what to eat. You're teaching them how to do insulin or how to use a pump or all those things. So again, multifaceted. Um, I just like to welcome Dr. Brown. She's joined our class this evening. So welcome Dr. Brown. Um, Thank you. Okay, so guys, we're gonna watch a little video. We're gonna transition a little bit into the different types of learning, okay? So we talked about it. We have that feeling, we have that knowledge, and we have that psychomotor. And I, we will go over some monomics that'll help you guys remember. So just give me a second and I'll pull up our video, okay? A lot of this I want you guys to know is, um, you know a lot of what we're learning tonight and what helps is, that you can apply it when you're thinking about it, right? Because even as student nurses, we're doing a ton of teaching. You know, I don't know, has anyone experienced in your clinical where the nurses say, oh, can you help me teach such and such? 
Anybody seen that? This yeah, I actually, um, last weekend, the nurse that I was with, she was discharging her patient and um, she had me, she's like, well, this part, we just read it to the patient word for word. So if you want to do that, you know. Was she standing with you at the time? Yeah, oh. literally looking over my shoulder, making sure <laughs> I read the words correctly. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's a good thing that I'm glad to hear that. So sometimes what happens is, is that um, as nursing students, we are put in a position where we're teaching, but I'm glad to hear that, oops, hold on. I'm glad to hear that they're sitting with you and they're with you guys teaching. Okay, here we go, I'm gonna share with you guys. Sorry, guys, for the ads. They're so silly. Can you guys hear? Not yet. Hold on. Oops, sorry guys. We could see it, but we can't hear it. I cannot hear it. Okay, no worries. I'm just gonna. My sister was to me. Here we go. I think it's doing it to me because Dr. Brown's here. How many videos do I show you guys? <laughs> that works just fine. Hold on. Where did my more go? All right, let's see how this is. Oh, my This is like, isn't this the way, guys? Ah, there you are. Don't go away. Okay. All right. There still isn't any sound. Oh, yeah, yeah. Are you kidding me? Oh, there we are. Hold on, hold on. Degree of complexity. Relatively simple skills, such yes. as the learning and recalling of um, the, what you call them, the facts, uh, are placed at the bottom of the hierarchy, while more complex skills, such as analysis and synthesis, are placed on the top. Not surprisingly, this domain is most often the focus of the educational system. For example, a student of literature might first memorize facts about Hamlet. Later, that student would write essays analyzing the theme of revenge or some other crap. At the highest level, the student would draw from the lower level skills to create original works of literature, preferably superior to those god-awful Twilight books. Sparkly vampires? Seriously? The psychomotor domain involves the adoption of skills requiring hand-eye coordination and other physical tasks. It doesn't have a whole lot to do with library instruction, so we're going to skip right on over to Ooh, the affective domain, Yay! which involves attitudes and values. It describes how people progress from ignorance of a subject to making that subject an integral part of who they are. At the lower levels, a person learns that a subject exists, chooses to pay attention to it, and responds to it with goodwill. At higher levels, the person makes an effort to interact with the subject, eventually making it a determining force in his or her life. For example, that same student of literature would begin by becoming aware that Hamlet exists, decide to read it, and enjoy the experience. Later, the student would acquire other plays and read them, maybe attend a performance. At the highest level, the student would come to appreciate literature as something of enduring value and make it a permanent part of his or her life. This three-way division exists purely for academic convenience. Learning domains are actually deeply interconnected, like the chicken is to its wings and drumsticks. Mm-hmm. 
just as the chicken becomes significantly less cute when subdivided, learning tends to suffer when domains are addressed in isolation. Build your brand online. With All righty. All right, so that was just another way that we can take a look at our domains of learning. And what did we notice in that video that corresponds with what we were talking about with different types of learning? What did you notice on that video that the guy did? Very visual. Good. So our visual learners could look at that, the arrows, could uh, look at the chicken, right? So what level do we think that he was teaching to? Would he be teaching to elementary? I, maybe like middle school, high school. -y. All right, let's see a show of hands. Who would show that for a middle schooler? Nobody, maybe. How about an elementary school? It's too complex. There we got some. And then how about a high school? How about adults? Good. What would you change if you were trying to teach an elementary school or younger child? What what kind of things would you put in there that might help? The cartoon. Color. More color. More color patterns. Cartoon. What do kids like to do? It's one of our domains of learning. Singing? Yeah, they That's love right. singing. Yeah. They love to do things, right? They love to touch. They like to make puppets. They like to. So a way we could teach that, right, to our little people is you having them actively involved, right, as opposed to sitting and listening. And our middle schoolers, what did we say is our great technique with our middle schoolers? Technology. Mm -hmm. So we could have them on their phone, maybe, you know, guessing games or doing something like that, right? And then our adults, we could, but what is, what's the holdback with that one with adults? Not everybody has technology, you know, a phone available with that technology. Okay, and so what if, if they yep. do, they don't necessarily know how to use it. Good, and what if we were teaching this to a large group of adults? We put it up on a, you know, a big fancy board. What do we have to be really sensitive to? Not slides, maybe? Say that again, Sylvia. Like slides, maybe? Yeah, slides, we can use slides for it. But what did you guys notice? You might not have noticed because you guys are, um, using higher level thinking at this point. What did anybody notice about the language in that? Oh, it was like very simple language, like very, you know, even the book they use as an example, it's something that middle schoolers would read, you know, Twilight. I know because I read it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but what I wanted you guys to see in that, and um, do I have anybody who's English second language? I do. I know I do. Yeah, I know I do, guys. So wasn't some of that language hard? Yeah, and that's okay. So we have to be really sensitive to that too, because we have a large in our communities. A I'm lot. Gonna say, I'm gonna say that I, I don't understand too much the the video. Okay. So me neither. Because the, the chicken goes, and you know that's. I too may too fast. Too yeah, fast. Too fast mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Good. So I want you guys to be sensitive to English second language because we are going to be teaching that. What kind of communities are we going to be teaching that in? Where are we going to say English second language? Immigrants. Where are we going to see immigrants? Rural areas. More rural, like farmers. Where else are we going to see them? It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Everywhere, honestly. Excellent. Excellent, Heidi. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's rural, it's urban, it's 
north, it's south, it's east, it's west, it's everywhere we are. So I want you guys to think about that when you're planning that um, some accommodations you can make, right, for um, English as second language learners. I am going to now have you guys do a little activity where you're going to apply what we've learned. So I'll put you guys in breakout rooms. I'm not going to do a jam board tonight because I know how much you guys love them. So I'm giving you a break tonight. And so what I'm going to have you guys do is you're going to get together as groups in our um, in breakout rooms, you're gonna pick, I'm gonna tell you a disease process. And what I want you guys to do is I want you to come up with um, something you're gonna teach, but you're gonna hit all three domains. So you're gonna hit effective, you're gonna hit cognitive, and you're gonna hit psychomotor, okay? So what I'll do is I'll give you guys like uh, four minutes and then we'll, we'll um, come back together and you're gonna share with us. What I want you guys to be thinking when you're doing this is I will tell you a little technique that I use for um, remembering. So effective, which is our feelings, has two Fs in it. So that's how I always remember effective. And then we have our psychomotor. It has the word motor in it. So this is how you remember motor is like a car. And so a car is or anything with a motor is usually moving or changing or doing something. So that's our two ways to remember those two. And then our cognitive, you know, um, is really something that I want you guys to be familiar with that word. So cognitive is just another word for thinking kind of. So think about that when you're doing it, okay? All right, so I'm doing you guys randomly though. So first group is gonna be group number one. You're in room number one and you guys are gonna be doing uh, a child Diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Okay. Uh, let me put you guys in room one now so we know who we are. Oh, then I'd have to assign you manually. Forget that. Okay. So if you're in room one, you're doing diabetes type 1 kid. Okay. If you're in room two, you're going to be a newly diagnosed 55-year-old with hypertension. And then if you are in room three, you're gonna have a family whose dad was just diagnosed with COVID and mom has the flu and grandma and an infant live with them. Okay, so we're gonna use all of our knowledge that we have and um, do that now, okay? So you guys are gonna have big groups tonight so everybody can contribute and then we'll come back together and see what you're- um, I'm sorry, yeah. and you say the grandma doesn't live with them or live with them, what did you yeah, say? Yeah, grandma lives with them. Thank you. And let's do one more, because this will be fun. One more is uh, school-aged kids about smoking. Good. All right, here we go, so. I'll assign you guys randomly, okay? Okay, here we go, guys. Yossi, you okay? Dr. Brown, do you want me to assign you as a co-host? Do you want to join uh, in the rooms? No, no, I'm just, I'm just here observing. Okay. Um, so I, don't I join in with them. I go in with them. Yeah, and go ahead. Talk it go through. ahead. Yeah, go ahead and go. Alright, guys. So, so you are di type one diabetic. Yeah, a child, right? Child. Yep. Okay. So I want you to think about what we would do for them, age wise. What we do for them? Who are we teaching other than just the child? Parents. The parents. And anyone who's worked with children knows that a lot of times. <laughs> Um, particularly with diabetes, it's poorly managed because the parents don't understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. 
So they'll say, oh, well, I thought they ate or I thought, you know what I mean? So um, be careful with how we're going to be teaching because we're going to be teaching to both. Right? How old is our child? Uh, let's say four. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can it be six? <laughs> it could be six. Six is fine. <laughs> So we're thinking about those kind of things. And so really all you guys are doing is you're not going to be, um, you're not going to be writing anything down. You're just going to kind of tell us what you came up with. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll leave you guys and I'll be back in a little bit. Like uh, cognitive effect effective meaning feelings um maybe even like put like let's say in the beginning you know you can definitely even establish like a meal plan and put like a paper on the refrigerator things to avoid things to you know yeah. remember uh, right. timers for hermetic new medications all right so we're 55 in here right hypertension yes mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what are we going to remember that we need to do with a newly diagnosed hypertensive? Is them how to monitor the blood pressure at home. Okay. Yeah. I was Is them about nutrition. Fall into the psychomotor. Diet. Heart. Diet. Good. Yeah. We were talking about developing a diet plan that can fall into more cognitive area, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. um, know the symptoms of, of hypertension, know when mm -hmm. to call the doctor, when to you know, seek help. Yep. One other thing we want to know with them is what are they probably going to be diagnosed? I mean, what are they probably going to be prescribed? Right. Um, um, yeah, but, uh, an antihypertensive medication. Mm -hmm. What do we know about antihypertensives? Um, they can cause your blood pressure to go low, very low. Mm -hmm. What else? Do, a lot of them have this thing where you have to know, don't take this if you take this. A lot of interactions, right? Yeah, yeah, a lot of interactions and a lot of side effects. What some can cause some swelling of the legs, mm -hmm. um, cough. You know, a lot of uh, actual physical side effects. Good. Right, to report. Yeah. yeah, good. You guys are on the right path. So all those things I want you to think about when you're teaching our class. Okay. So we'll what do we have to do? We have to write and like type it down or just talk? No, you're just gonna talk. <laughs> I mean, if you really want to, then you can address those visual learners, but I won't make you. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we just, just like we told you, we would tell them. Yeah, sort of. Okay. And so we're gonna have everybody contribute what they think if they come up with something too, okay? Top of the, of the chain. Right. Uh, okay. So I think we should ask the, for example, to the to the dad, we should ask him, hey, do you wanna stay here or you wanna go to a hotel? Because I mean, I, I think we should let him decide since they are like a more. Yeah, so to, to they protect are, the their, their yeah. mentality is different than the than the young people. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in this situation that you work. guys have you really want to be thinking about feelings because imagine how overwhelming that is in a household. Yeah. Right. Cause everybody's feeling pretty scared. Maybe. Good. So how might you find out the feelings of your people? Worry. I mean, yeah, they might be worried. What's the therapeutic kind of method for you to get some information on how they're feeling? you ask yeah 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 so what happens if somebody said how are you feeling i know if somebody asked me i always say fine don't you guys i always say i'm fine you know yes. so yeah, we want to do something that's really open-ended right right mm -hmm. they're probably more focused on what we're really aiming to get an answer for maybe mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. how do you feel about being having covid and there's an infant in your house mm -hmm. how do you feel about mm -hmm. that good good that's something to, important to remember when we're trying to assess her feelings and what do we also know about feelings as a whole with people is everybody open to spill the beans no and it, no. it especially depends on the culture that they are definitely not mm -hmm. 
like we know our Mexican um, culture that we had on our test, right? The big yeah. thing we knew about them is they want some chit chat with you. So they're not going to just want to talk about COVID and the flu. They're going to mm -hmm. talk about, oh, this happened or, you know, or you try to start that conversation with them, right? Mm -hmm. but, all right. Well, we're almost done. I'll, I'll have you guys come back. But you're just going to like kind of talk to us and we're going to put in some things when you talk. Okay. Okay. Activities that promote what? Activities. How are we doing in here? Uh, We're doing our best. Yeah, <laughs> the last one. <laughs> I know you guys got the really hard one. No, I'm only kidding. So, school age kids, what do we know about them and what do we know about their learning? So, it has to be very simplistic. We're They're talking about like elementary students, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it has to be super simple to the point. Their attention span is all over the place, so we have to just go, 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 and and give them the information directly and quickly. And what are you going to know so, about their psychomotor with these little ones? Wow, how that's going to be a big one for them. So, what kind of things do they like to do as school aged? Color paint. So for that one, so for psychomotor skills, um, the team came up with tobacco prevention activities that focus on the school age. Children. Mm -hmm. so. okay. And what kind of things are we going to do? We're going to show them, right? We're going to show them mm -hmm. this is what it looks like. And, you know, and we also want them to give us feedback too. Like, have they seen it before? You know, that kind of stuff, right? Because a lot of times kids want to share. And so if we leave an avenue for open communication with them, they're going to love to share. So that's an important thing to think about, right? Yes. And then Perfect. we can sort of do, uh huh. For effective, um, would this be um, okay? Tobacco, um, tobacco use is very deadly. So we would show them like statistics, like little well, bar graphs and stuff. Mm -mm. Mm, yeah. That because remember, effective is our feelings. Oh, yeah. right. So we're gonna look and see what are these kids. We can sometimes see their feelings on their faces. Anybody, you can see their feeling on their faces or the way they respond when you say something, they'll say, oh no, or something like that, right? So that's their feeling coming out. So maybe a question could be, what, um, what does this make you think of? Or what does this make you feel like? Or something like that. Remember with little ones too, or draw a picture of how you feel when you see cigarette smoking or tobacco because remember we're also teaching with tobacco you know it, it comes in vapes now so we want to be sensitive to that too right and psychomotor is going to be easy for this group and i'll tell you why because they don't want to sit still right <laughs> so almost anything they can do hands-on games uh, you know whatever is going to be really effective for them okay i'm going to end our group session and then so we'll all come back together and we're just going to um sort of figure out what we all came up with okay so I'm leaving you guys, but then I'm going to. This meeting is being recorded. <clears throat> All right, we're all coming back. You guys were coming up with some good ideas there, so I'm glad about that. I don't know why I just said it's being recorded. I was recording it, but maybe someone somewhere along the way is recording. All right, guys, so what I wanted you guys to do was apply what we learned, and you guys came up with some really good ideas. So our first group was room number one, and we had a child diagnosed with diabetes for the group. It was a six-year-old, so, okay. So we have a six-year-old type one diabetes. Tell us a little bit about your group and what you came up with and what you were thinking. Um, hi, um, so we had a six-year-old with diabetes and so we knew that we would have to teach both the parent, mm -hmm. actually the parent more so than the child at six, um, but, you know, teaching the child a lot too. Um, the psychomotor teaching we would do would be, um, 
the with the testing the test strips um how you know giving injections how that going to feel and then also having them do that teach back so that they gain that muscle memory um and then how how the symptoms would look to the parents how they would feel to the child like if they were starting to get hypoglycemic if they would feel you know sweaty lethargic you know things like that and then our affective learning um that the for the child that it's okay to feel frustrated, you know, cause there's a lot of changes. He's not always going to feel like they're the, going to feel left out from the peers sometimes with the different things that maybe that he feels like he can't eat this or he can't eat that. Um, and then for the cognitive um, learning, the medication schedule, um, learning, uh, I, I didn't write down the rest of it, but we did talk about it. So my, in my group wants to, to hop in and finish that. Sure, somebody help Jesse out there. Um, basically that, you know, sometimes when you have this condition, um, the learning uh, can have some, some moments of um, spare, like it's a little slow because of the fogginess or how you feel. And that doesn't mean exactly that it's uh, in the child development, it's just part of the condition. Okay, good. How are we gonna assess the feeling though on a six-year-old? about how they feel. You let them talk to you about how they feel. You ask them questions about what, you know, type one diabetes means to them. Make sure that you explain it in, in very simple terms that they understand and can process and then share how they're feeling with you. All right, what's a tool that we might be able to use with little ones to see how they're feeling? Toys. You can bring in toys. Since that for them is the whole, you know, that's bringing it down to them so they can bring in the toy to let them explain this is what, you know, what's going on and see if we're all on the same page. Good. I remember you can always use, like we use something in the hospital with all our patients, remember pictures for pain? You could use something yeah, like that for face. feelings, right? A smiley face, yeah. a flat face, a sad face for a child. Wouldn't that help? Faces. The faces, you mean? The faces. Yeah, faces. Yeah. Or okay. the numbers, but when they're little like that, they may not know numbers. They may not know one comes after, you know, one comes before two, but good. Very good. Uh, group number two with our hypertensive 55 year old. I know you guys worked on it. <laughs> okay. <I can. laughs> so um, we had the 55 year old newly hypertensive. So main, the main issue is um, it's teaching the new diagnosis. So what symptoms to report, um, what symptoms to look out for, um, what uh, side effects the medications can can bring them, reminding uh, maybe pillbox set up to know the, med the medication, to remember to take the medications. Um, what kind, what the kind of learning is a pillbox? Um, I think psychomotor. Why would it be so? You're right, but why would that be? Well, because I physically have to, you know, pre-fill, put it in, set it up, you know, maybe write it down somewhere, set a timer, because um, it's all new, so you could forget. Okay, good. Keep going. Um, diet, you know, we would teach diet. It's a big, it's a big one with uh, hypertension. What foods to avoid? Maybe even putting up uh, like a pamphlet or pictures of things to avoid, especially in the beginning, so it becomes. Um, you know, the new normal of what not to eat, you know, in case they're like a visual learner. Um, mm -hmm. And what domain would that be? A picture, a list? I'm not sure. Somebody help her out. What would a list of things to not eat or eat be? Cognitive. 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 Uh, cognitive. Okay, why is cognitive? You're right, but why would it be? Because it's more about learning and, you know, you have to actually think about it and process it. Mm -hmm. And you're reading it. Good. Really yeah, it's remembering it. Yep. Good. All right. And then what else do you guys have? Um, I mentioned uh, monitoring their own blood pressure at home. That could be a psychomotor. Mm -hmm. um, as far as effective, I mean, she's 55. I mean, you can just kind of offer her some, 
support, I guess. Like, I don't know. You could, but how would we assess the feeling on a 55 year old? I mean, ask her questions. Um, are we going to say, how are you feeling? What happens when you say, guys, think to yourself, when somebody says, how are you feeling? Fine. Nine out of 10 times, you probably <laughs> say fine, right? Maybe we can ask, really like, you those. know, what does, what does hyper, being a hypertensive mean to you? Or what changes do you think? How is this going to affect your day to day? Do you think it's something that you can manage on your own? Or, you know, what are, you know, how can we help you know that you can live with this and you can manage it properly? Good. Yeah, you're going to have that open end, right? Communication. So tell me what it feels like, right? All right, and then we're going to go to our third group, which was lots of stuff going on there. Okay, so we have the dad that has COVID, the mom has the flu, and grandma and infant lives with them. Um, so the effect we're looking at, um, obviously COVID and flu is a big thing. Um, lots of people die like every year with it. So then you're looking at a family that there's a lot of fear and anxiety in there because you have a family that's basically has two people that's living there with probably like low immunity um, in the household that can also get sick. So there's like a lot of concern um, that's happening there. Um, cognitive, we were looking at the type of learning. So we have like four different age groups. Well, actually three different age groups. The dad, mom and one. Grandma is in a different age group. Of, and there's an infant who is probably you know, clinging to the parents. So then you have to teach this child, you kind of be by the parent. Um, you got a grandma that's older, again, might be a visual learner, might be, you know, a reading person like we were talking before. Um, so then you're looking at, again, like we were talking when you came to the room professor, like it might be even like the Mexican families that there might be a language barrier. So of course you have to target what language they might be able to understand. Um, so they, they're aware of what's going on as well. So it kind of helps with the fear a bit. Um, psychomotor, we were looking at, um, again, we have two people that's really sick. They may not be able to move around. This is a highly contagious disease. Um, so you're looking at, they may have to stay in the home. So you're looking at having to go out there, they can't get food, you know, they can't have resources. It's kind of limited. So um, arrangement has to be made for probably like Instacart to deliver food to their houses. Um, be able to teach um, what to look for for the virus, okay, and symptoms, symptoms. be able to go to the PCP office, stuff like that. Symptoms that you're going to look for um, when you have the, the COVID virus, also teach them about how you may feel after the vaccine, once you know you get the vaccine after the virus. Um, what domain is that going to be hitting when we're teaching to them about side effects and Things like that. What kind of that domain is that going to be? Mm, I would say cognitive. Mm -hmm. you, you're right. So guys, don't doubt yourself. Most of you are like, mm, you, you know it. So it's good. So when we're looking at feelings and how we're going to do teach to feelings is we're going to really have them do a lot of th um, verbal th therapeutic communication, right? When we're doing so psychomotor, we're doing that motor, we're using those hands, we're doing things with them. And then with our cognitive, that's a lot of what I said to you guys before, like that's why you guys have lecture, right? Because you're not, I mean, I try to actively engage you as best I can, but I can't make you get up and jump around, right? So that's where your psychomotor and where do we see that in nursing school? We see that in our Sims, right? Yeah. We're applying that knowledge. So good, very good. And then our last group, they thought it was hard, but I think they did great. All right, school age, school age smoking. Yeah, so for our group, the school age smoking, uh, the effective, obviously, because of its feeling, um, we put, uh, like, draw how you feel, how does smoking make me feel, you know, things like that. Um, we kept it short and simple, but the cognitive, um, ideas that we came up with is like poster boards or uh, showing how smoking is bad, um, you know, thinking about different ways of symptoms and stuff like that, of like how bad smoking can be and affect everybody around them and themselves. And uh, psychomotor, um, we thought of uh, like tobacco prevention activities, uh, you know, to promote, um, you know, and then 
about how how have they seen it before? Where do they uh, you know stuff like that? And then like the the, the activities since they're they don't want to stay still, just you know post like I said, just doing activities to show how smoking can be bad and stuff like that. What's something we could do? For, for their psychomotor, teach them so psychomotor, because they, they like to move around. That's true. Little ones tend to like to move around. So what are some things we could do with them? Um, we came up with it, I guess, uh, like um, painting and stuff like that, right? Painting? You guys could play games with them, right? Games. Particularly games, if it's a group. Like right, they love right. games, right? Those mm -hmm. kind of things. Good. We're not going to be giving them a lecture about it because they're going to no. tune us out quickly okay and that's developmentally appropriate so that's what we should be seeing all right good work guys so i want you to know those three domains pretty well and it i um i think you guys are on board there now you guys have a peds exam you said following our class right so let's do this instead of a 10 minute break can we take a five minute break and then we'll come back and then um I'll I'll get you guys out so you're ready for your PEDS exam. Okay, so it is now uh, seven sixteen Eastern time. So we're gonna go till seven twenty one. Okay, thank All you. Right, I'll see everybody in five minutes. Okay.
All righty, guys, we're coming back. Sorry, I know it's such a short break, but I want to get you guys out of here a little early. All right, so the next topic, we have two topics that are left to cover tonight. What I will tell you is the first one we're going to look at because um, is going to be our chapters on violence. We have two chapters on infectious disease. What I want you guys to know about infectious disease, you guys already know most of it. Um, uh, when we're looking at infectious disease, we want to know how it's spread. So like our HIV, our hepatitis, how are those ones spread? Gonorrhea, chlamydia, how are they spread? Through sex. <laughs> yeah, through body fluids, right? Yeah, body fluids. Body fluids. Um, who's going to be most vulnerable for those kind of things are going to be those that have some mental illness as a high risk category. What else is a high risk category? Immunocompromised. Mm -hmm. Well, they'll be immunocompromised, but yeah, definitely. What else? Homeless. What kind of, say that again. Homeless. Population. Yeah, homeless. Mm -hmm. uh, we see vulnerable. Go ahead, what? IV drug users. Yeah, good. That was what I was really looking forward to. So those ones that are compromised, who are compromised for part of our vulnerable populations, right? Are homeless or teenagers are, well, it's usually adolescents. Um, pregnant adolescents, but um, those kind of things. I want you to think about that when you're thinking about who's most vulnerable. You guys know how they spread. You guys did some research on research on infectious disease. So therefore, um, I feel comfortable leaving that in your hands, okay? Do a little reading on it. Um, I, think, I think HIV is the one we focus more on. Um, there's a whole lot of information out there. Best resource you can do on these sexually transmitted diseases, I will tell you, hint, hint. CDC has a wonderful thing at cdc.gov slash STD. And that will be your sexually transmitted diseases. Gives you tons of information, signs, symptoms, um, treatments, prevention. What is our prevention going to be with our STDs? Safe sex. Um, yes. So sorry. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, where are we going to teach? How are we going to teach that? Use condoms. Yeah. We're going to not give out condoms because that crosses the line sometimes, but we are going to have them available or tell them where they're available, right? We're going to have, uh, we have in, in process right now in the United States of America, we have needle exchange ports, right? Where people can dump their needles and get new ones. So think about those kind of things with our infectious disease. All right, for the last section of the class, what I'm gonna do because violence is our last two chapters. What I'll tell you is this is a very sensitive subject for lots of people. So what I want to tell you is that we're gonna do a Kahoot with it. And the only reason that we're doing that is because I think that's a good way to teach about it. Please, if you, it's a sensitive topic for you, I understand and um, I will be sensitive to that. What do we know about violence in the United States of America? That it's on the rise. On the rise, where do we see it? In homes. In homes. In homes, where else? The workplace. The teenage population. School. Mm -hmm. Yep, oh. yep, you guys are all right. The workplace, the schools, the, you know, everywhere. Violence is on the rise. COVID had an impact on mental health. And that is what we saw with COVID was an increase in what, in what kind of violence? Does anyone know? Domestic violence. Mm -hmm. domestic, yeah. Why was there an increase in domestic violence? So People were together. Stuck together. together. Were together most of the time. Yeah, everybody stuck in the house together, right? And yeah, they're like, frustrated. Oh mm -hmm. And what also happened with uh, employment? Right, yeah. that kind of tanked a little bit for some people. Um, so that would be a frustrating thing that leads to domestic violence sometimes. Kids is another big violence thing that we'll look at. So we're gonna do this Kahoot together, okay? And then um, I will let you guys go for the evening. So let's get to it. I'm gonna lecture like a little bit through the Kahoot. So just, but I think you guys are gonna do really well in this. So hold on, let me just open it up and then.
Thank you for your cooperation with the visitor this evening as well. I never know, so that's why we always have our cameras on. Come on. Sorry, guys, my computer's so slow tonight. I don't know what is going on. All right, we're joining here. I'll share my screen with you guys. All right, here's our pin four four seven nine six one four. So this Kahoot, just so you guys know, there's gonna be a little bit of overlap with infectious disease and violence. So I'm gonna skip some of the infectious disease ones unless I think they're good. But there's a couple that I'm like, uh, you guys already know. What? I've never had this before. Player limit reached? Are you kidding? Yeah, it won't let me. Um. All right. So do it, do it. Oh, hey now. This is just not fair. Okay, if you can't join on the Kahoot, can you guys uh put it in the chat? Put your answers in the chat, okay? So, uh, I'll show you in a minute. This has never happened before. Has anybody seen this on a Kahoot? No. It, this is like my night. I'm sure. If if I'm still, if I'm, this is typical. Anyway, all right, here we go. Children at more, oh, children at more at risk of experience health care challenges due to what? Whether race, personal income, or having health insurance. Whether's A, personal incomes, B, the race is C, and D is having health insurance. Okay, so, all right. Well, so we had a little trouble with this one. So what I will tell you on this one, if I were writing this question, I would have taken two. And what that is, is because um, race or ethnicity, we do see a higher rate of certain things with children genetically, right? We know the importance of genetics. And so that's where this question is coming from. And personal income has a huge impact. Why does personal income have a huge impact? Because if you don't have money to take the child to the doctor and you don't have health insurance or anything, you're not going to take it. Right. Right. Exactly. Good. Okay. Now we're going to go now. Oh, my goodness. Who is not behaving tonight? All right. Let's see. This is multi-select. These are really, really, I don't like this one either. This wasn't the, okay. We'll just go to the next one. Hold on. There's a lot on health disparity. So what I will tell you is I worked with this Kahoot earlier today and the questions are a little different. So I noticed somebody changed them. So just hold on. Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe I shared the wrong one. Okay, we're not going to do this tonight. I'll tell you that much. All right, so what I will tell you about abuse that we will take a look at, we'll take a look at a case study. How about that? And that'll let us do it. And then this is just not helping tonight. All right, let me share my screen with you. We'll do a case study together. Okay, so we have, somebody want to read that for us? I'll do it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go. Who's the, me? Okay. Uh, Sarah Anderson is the school nurse of an educational complex serving an elementary, middle, and high school on the same campus. She is responsible for approximately uh, 2,400 students. 
She has a medical assistant who helps monitor compliance with the state mandate immunization documentation. Sarah's role is primarily related to illness care and treatment of students with chronic needs. She also organizes all students and parent education related to health promotion and disease prevention. All right, a first question. You guys will put your answers in the chat. Mrs. Anderson has uh, recently been seeing a 12 year old for complaints of vague symptoms. She comes to the office almost daily and the nurse has noted a trend with the time of day. She appears anxious and nervous when she's deemed ready to return to class. What problem could be suspected by Ms. Anderson? She's seeking attention. She's got ADHD. She wants to be a nurse or she's being bullied. All right, what kind of things are alerting us when we read this? That she's anxious and nervous to go back to class. Mm -hmm. And it's around the same time. Mm -hmm. What else might we see here with a 12 year old coming to the nurse other than that? Vague. Say that again. Vague symptoms. Yeah, vague symptoms. What are kids going to certain times look for trusted adults with? Sometimes they just want attention. They, they want to feel accepted and loved because they're not getting it at home. Mm -hmm. The other thing to think about, yes, with that is, is that oftentimes kids are looking for an out. If you have a child that is experiencing violence in the home, they oftentimes will find a safe adult that they can confide in or spend time with. And what you need to do with these kids is be really sensitive to it and see. But the actual answer, yeah, is D. So we never want to say that a kid's looking for attention because there's usually something beneath the attention, okay? So in this one, she's probably being bullied or pressured in the classroom. That's what we say. We never just want to say, though, that they're just looking at us for attention. They're looking at us for attention, but there's something more to it. Okay, so you don't want to just say they're attention seeking necessarily. What primary prevention is useful when we're preventing violence in the school and the community? There should be a keyword that you guys are focusing on here. Anybody know? Education, like the teaching? In the question itself. Oh, in the question. Prevention. Yeah. Primary. Yep, primary. What do we all know about primary? Teaching. Teaching, education. So we could probably look at all of that and decide without even looking at the answer, what do we all know it is? Teaching, educating. That's what we're doing, right? Organize a violence screening day. What kind of prevention would that be? Secondary. Secondary. Good. Referrals to appropriate community organizations. Uh, tertiary. 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 It's tertiary because we're we're already sending out support groups is going to be our tertiary, tertiary as well. Right? Tertiary. Okay. Good. All right. Let's see. Okay. Middle and high school students participate in cross-country practice every day after school. The school nurse works with the cross-country coach to provide safety education to the students. What measures are taught to the students about reducing vulnerability? And this is a big part of what we're going to um, look at is our vulnerability to violence. There's going to be more than one here, guys.
Okay, we're getting a bunch of A, B, and E. So when we look at our answers, very good. We have our people take measures to reduce by improving their security. We're gonna organize crime watches. We're gonna look for um, agreeing on another one's property to make sure we know our boundaries and things like that and teaching individual and neighborhood safety programs. Good. I really wanna find this Kahoot. I'm sorry, I don't know why this one was wrong. The one, I wanna do it because there's a bunch of violence. How about we do it this way? Uh, I'll ask you the questions and you guys can answer in the chat. Ready? Which of the following is a top risk factor for intimate partner homicide? A, there's a gun in the house. B, the husband made threats against the wife. C, the wife has called 911 because of the husband beating her. Or D, the woman's young daughter lives with them. What do you think is going to be the highest risk for intimate partner homicide? A gun, the husband made threats, the wife is called 911, or the young woman's daughter lives with them. Interesting. Almost everybody's picking A. So a gun is a high risk, but what is homicide? Murder? So, yeah, yeah, somebody kills somebody else. Did somebody kills somebody else. Who is going to be the one that's most vulnerable to be killed? The daughter. The, well, not the daughter. Well, the, the, wife. Wife. the wife. Because the wife is the more domestic vulnerable. violence. Right. So if you're going to, if someone who's most vulnerable there, if you have the a wife. gun, that doesn't mean your husband's going to use it, right? No. If you've called 911 already, that makes you pretty vulnerable. Because obviously mm -hmm. you're, they're reporting domestic abuse previously, right? Mm -hmm. That would be our best answer. I wish I had these in front of me, but all right. A teacher asked the school nurse to assess a child for neglect. Which assessment findings could indicate neglect? A, bruises in various stages. B, failure of parent to attend parent-teacher conferences. C, lack of weight gain and wearing dirty clothes. And D, lice in the air. In the hair. Sorry, not the air. Ooh. <laughs> All right, we're getting mostly C's, which is correct. What are we going to look for with neglect? What does neglect mean? When the child is not being taken care of. Mm -hmm. So, okay. which of those is the child is a definite sign the child's not being taken care of? Dirty clothes, right? Now, could that mean that the parents need some education? Could it be that they don't have any other clothes? Could it be lots of things? Yeah. But regardless of the reason, that's still neglect on the behalf of the child, right? And lack of weight gain. So maybe we're dealing with some neglect of not feeding them. So when we think about neglect with children, we want to be very aware of our symptoms that we'll look for. Now, bruises in various places. The reason that wouldn't be the choice is because a lot of times on children and neglect or children and abuse, those bruises are not visible. Okay, so they're going to be hidden under shirts, under pants, you know, that kind of thing. Which of the following may lead to increased violence, adequate social support, feelings of powerlessness, violence shown in the media, or living in a crowded environment? There's more than one answer. No. You want me to repeat them? Yes, please. Yes, so please. A is adequate social support. B is feelings of powerlessness. C is violence shown in the media. And D is living in a crowded environment. All right, we're getting all over the place here. So. The answer is three of those. So a couple of you got that. So feelings of powerlessness, you're gonna see that a ton with domestic violence in the home. They're, the violence is a, is a power struggle. So it's them needing to feel power. Now I want you to be very clear here that domestic violence does not necessarily mean man to woman. It could mean woman to man. Has anyone ever seen that? Yeah. So that's popping up quite a bit. And so just, 
be aware that that domestic violence go either way. Domestic violence can go transgender as well, right? Male to male, female to female. So just think about that when we're thinking about it. But anyway, so their powerlessness is a key to abuse and violence. Violence shown in the media, we have seen, and as the way to remember this is we see repeat behavior. We have seen shootings and then someone goes and shoots. We've seen suicide and then someone kills themselves. So the stuff in the media is scary because it, it increases violence tremendously. And then living in a crowded environment, why do you think that would increase violence? It does, but I'm asking why. What's What do we know about crowded environments? They're high stress, and then also it increases the number of victims, it increases the number of potential offenders. Yeah. And no, in a crowded apartment, think about it. If anybody's lived in a small apartment in their entire life, just kind of like COVID, how domestic abuse was on the rise, same concept. Everybody's smushed on top of each other, right? And everybody's frustrated with everybody. So keep that in mind. All right. Um, number one cause of death worldwide. Number one cause, ready? Chronic disease, infectious disease, injuries, or terrorism. Worldwide, remember. <laughs> A is chronic, B is infectious, C is injury, D is terrorism. Your answers are interesting tonight. All right, so uh, chronic disease in the United States is one of the leading causes. What I will tell you is infectious, infectious disease worldwide is the number one, okay? And a lot of people picked injuries. Injuries are for one age group. What age group is that? No. Oh, the children. School aged, yeah. School, school aged kids, they fall off, they break their arms, they run in front of a car. They do all kinds of crazy stuff because they don't know. All right, we'll do two more and then I'll let you guys go, okay? Um, I really shouldn't let you go early, but I know you're taking a test. So, and those of you who don't have a test, you can stay on if you want. I'll go over more questions with you or whatever you want. All right, a nurse man two test is positive for exposure to tuberculosis. This goes with our infectious disease, okay? Positive for TB. Which conclusion could be drawn by the nurse? She has TB, she's been exposed to TB, the test is inaccurate, or the positive test is probably due to something in the testing. Good, we're getting a lot of Bs. We do know that when you are positive for tuberculosis, that does not mean it's active. What do we look at on a TB test? You guys have all had one, I know by it's now. the skin test. The redness? What or... the just... Yeah, what do we have to make it sure it measures below? Isn't it below five? Below five. Five millimeters? Ten. Yeah, it's 10. 0.5 mm, right? So it's gonna be small. Um, you don't really need to know that. Just know that if you test positive for it, that doesn't mean you have it. What are some symptoms of TB? Um, coughing up bloody sputum. Coughing up what? Bloody sputum and night sweats. Night sweats. Yeah, you're sick with TB. So if you have a positive TB test and you're healthy walking around, you don't have TB, right? You could have been exposed, but, and also there's another group that comes up positive for TB with the PPD test. Who is that? A lot of immigrants because of the vaccines. Yeah, good. Um, right, I'm gonna ask one more question because it's sort of along our disease processes. Six students over, uh, six students, we kind of went over this, but six students order meals at a local restaurant. Which of the following are at highest risk for illness? Okay. One student asks for a salad with chicken strips and dressing on the side. The second student asks for a hamburger, very rare. The third student orders a tuna salad sandwich with extra mayo. And the fourth one orders a soft boiled egg.
Good. Somebody who answered B, why is the hamburger the most risky? Because it's not cooked properly. What's that thing that we get from not cooked properly? Salmonella. Mm -hmm. Yep, and it'll make you sick. All right, guys. So um, at this point, I will give you 15 minutes to get off and go study. What I want to go over, though, with you very quickly, please, is what I need of this week. I have had a couple of you guys who are not answering the attestation questions. I will tell you, Dr. Brown is on top of that, and you will not pass the class without them filled out. You got to go in there. You got to answer the questions, okay? If you're a little late, send me a quick email. You'll be fine. Don't worry. But I need you guys to answer those, okay? And most of you are doing that, so don't stress about that. Number two, you have your um, infectious disease. You're going to be handing in. Everybody's handing it in separately. If you have any questions on APA or anything, email it to me tonight, and I can help you guys fix it. And then um, I'll send it back to you, okay? So if you guys are nervous about that, just because that's a big part of our um, project, I mean, our whatever you call it, rubric. Um, I think Quick question while we're on that. Yeah. For the, the peer review, again, just to reiterate what you had said earlier in the class, if because our group was amazing. So I'm really, I, I feel bad even going away from five. Um, can I just say that we all did well and then yes. that's it? And we all did, yes. Because we all yes. concur yeah. with that. So okay. if there, so what I will tell you, if three out of the four were a five and one was a one, fill out three for, you know, three for five and the one for one, if that makes okay, sense. No. So you don't have yes. to grade everybody separately. If everybody worked, did their part, yes. was happy, yes. then send me one peer review and say the okay. whole group got a five. Good? Perfect. Okay, thank you. And the only reason that we do that is so that we can get some input, you know, because there's a lot of times people won't say if a group isn't working well, and then it's not fair if somebody's done the whole project, right? We all know. Right, that. right. No, that was not our case at all. Like, yeah. honestly, no, no, I don't, I'm, I'm not saying it is, but I'm just saying. And if I yeah, find yeah, this yeah. Kahoot, I will I'll post it for you guys because it was a really good a one. Link or yeah, can you send us the Kahoot? I'm going to try because I don't know why they changed it on me, but what do I oh, know? Okay. So if I can find it, Thank I will send you. it. And I'll send out our PowerPoints for this week. Uh, we went through violence relatively quickly. What I need you guys to know is you got to be really therapeutic with it. Have your ears open at all times. Look for signs and symptoms at all uh, costs. You know who's most vulnerable for violence? What kind of risk factors are we going to have for violence? Young people. Young people. Are elderly. People that are have elderly. had abuse before. I was going to show you guys a video. I will not do it because I don't want to take your time, but there's an ACE study that's out and what they have found is children. It's a study that was done many years ago. They find children who have um, these ACE studies. So a divorce in the family, a chronic illness, their risk for poor illness is increased. I may show it to you guys at the beginning of next class, but it's a really interesting study to look at from Kaiser Permanente and had run it. But anyway, but I'll let you guys go now. And I know I've said that three times, but you guys can go. Good luck on your PEDS test. And um, I will see you guys next week. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Welcome. Bye. 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 Good, Good night. night. Professor. Yeah. Really quick. I already yeah. my, my project. So in the last part, we says reference. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it show blue. So should I Leave it like that, or should I put it That's like hyperlink? Is it a website? Yes. That's why it's turning blue. The only thing I would do is go to your Purdue Al. Remember that website? Type in the, you can just copy and paste the website and then post it in the Purdue Al, and it'll show you how to cite it. So just do that, because it'll make it okay. easier for you. Don't worry about the blue. I, I'm not really worried about the blue. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Have a good night. Thank you, too. Thank you. Hi, Katrina. Hey, I want to just schedule an appointment with you for um to meet this uh, review my exam. I just want to review my exam. Yeah. Um. Okay. Do you want to review it now?